welcome to the banks of the Mississippi River for today's HECTV Live, the science behind the new Mississippi River Bridge. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore, your host for HECTV Live, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the construction site for this cable stayed bridge that's being built just north of the Gateway Arch. Today you'll meet the construction workers, engineers, designers, and project managers who are bringing this bridge to life. What did it take to put those foundations into the river? How do you design a bridge to take into account barge traffic as well as car traffic above? Ask your questions by emailing us at live at hectv.org and for interactive video conference viewers, we're going to get to your questions as well. Let's see what it takes to put that bridge into this river. Hi everybody, Tim Gore joining you in studio now for our program on HECTV Live today, the science behind the new Mississippi River Bridge. That's the location where the bridge is being built just north of the Gateway Arch. Today we're going to have the opportunity to meet three individuals who are working on this project to help you understand what it takes to put a bridge into the middle of a river, so to speak. As always, we welcome your questions throughout the program. So if you're joining us via view-only video conference, the web, or local television, email us your questions to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. We're also being joined by some interactive video conference schools throughout the country. I'll be coming to you guys for questions at many times during the program and I look forward to your interaction as well. So what does it take to put a bridge into the middle of the river? That's what we're going to find out. This is a large bridge, weighs a lot, has to span a great deal of distance and of course has to carry a great deal of traffic. So how do you make sure that your the construction process is safe but that the bridge also ends up being safe. Let's begin by looking a bit generally at the whole nature of putting the bridge there and why this location and the design parameters that make a difference. To do that we're going to meet Jeff Smith who's joining us today. He's the project manager and structural engineer for HNTB. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us. Great to be here. So we'll talk a little bit with the students just about what it is you get to do as a project manager and structural <laughs> engineer. What does that mean exactly? It's, it all sounds very exciting. But uh, a lot of what I do, I coordinate with various entities, uh, the, the owner, uh, our design team, uh, uh, other people that have a stake in the project, and, uh, and just make sure the information is flowing properly between everyone, making technical decisions that, that, that make the right impacts in a timely basis. Now we're going to bring up an image of the, of the bridge itself, and obviously it's just um, north of the Gateway Arch. Why, did, why is this bridge going in? Why did we feel the need to have a bridge in the first place? Well, the existing uh, Poplar Street Bridge in downtown St. Louis currently carries three interstates, one of only two in the nation that do that. So I saw, saw a lot of traffic, more than it was ever really designed for. And in order to alleviate some of that congestion, uh, community leaders got together about 20 years ago and, uh, and, and decided that a new bridge was really a necessity for the region. So uh, we got to, at that point, you start t figuring about what you want your bridge to do. You know, what's the purpose of your bridge? Uh, when you try and figure out what's, uh, what, your site need, what your site constraints are. Uh, in this case, the, you know, the purpose was to move traffic out of downtown on I-70 and, uh, and still connect the highways across the river. So that led to the, that led to the, the site, which is just north of the river, st stays out of downtown, and, uh, and crosses the river at a point where it makes structural sense to do so. And we've got a great animation that the audience is going to be able to see, which will give the, everybody an idea of what the bridge will look like in its final product, and then of course what it's going to be like to drive across the bridge. But in addition to the general location in terms of like just south of down, pardon me, north of downtown and to take the traffic flow, you guys had to think specifically geologically, I guess, as well, right, about where exactly uh, it should go. I mean, <laughs> did you all do like geological tests, like the bedrock's better here, that kind of thing? Uh, there is some of that in the very preliminary analysis because that's going to ultimately impact, you know, the, the cost of the bridge. Uh, you know, you want to put it at a point, you, know, you want to put it at the widest point of the river. Obviously, then you need a bigger bridge, it costs more money. Uh, so, you, you do take preliminary borings typically and find out what's down there. And you get to, a, you get to a, a point where, you know, the things balance and things work out right. And that, that animation is absolutely spectacular. So that gives everybody an idea of what the bridge will look like in its final format. We're on the Missouri side now going across over to the Illinois side as people look at it. And then the north would be the upper part of the image. Am I right about that, Jeff, as yes. we look at it? And the south is the lower part of the image. That's correct. Oh, good. Every once in a while, it's how I'm, my, my fifth grade social studies teacher is always happy when I, get, when I get my geography correct. Now, our next animation will give the students a, a general idea of how it's being constructed, because you're building from the banks into the middle, right? Right. 
Those pier locations are dictated to provide a certain width by the Coast Guard so that, that uh, barges and, and other river traffic have a, have a safe, path, safe width to pass through. So those are, those are set as far as where, where in the river and how wide those are. And, and in this case, they ended up near, near, near both banks of the river. So we're almost expanding the entire river here. Because there's a great deal of barge traffic that goes up and down the, the Mississippi River near St. Louis. Absolutely. You, so that's actually one of the design parameters you have to consider, right? Barge traffic would be one of the factors? Barge, barge traffic is one of the factors in, in, uh, in spanning a navigable river, river like, the, like the Mississippi. In fact, you know, a, a fully loaded barge can tow can weigh six million or 60 million pounds. Wow. So if you're going to design for an accidental impact by that, you know, it's, it's really a significant load to take into account. Now, as you thought about it just in the, from the very beginning of the basics, what other design parameters are you looking at? Well, there's, there's lots of things you have to take into account. You know, what, there's what we call dead load, uh, which is all the, all the loads that are, are the parts of the structure that are always going to be there, not, not moving, uh, concrete and steel. And we have a pretty good idea what those weigh. We know what those weigh um, and, and how much we're going to put down. Uh, and then there's other loads, live loads, things like traffic, trucks, cars. Uh, and you know, their trucks are supposed to only weigh a certain amount, but you don't know that, mm -hmm. and you don't know how many of them are going to be on the bridge at the same time. So you you have to take that into account for factors of safety when when you're considering you know how many trucks you could pack onto that bridge at one point. And there's environmental factors: wind, obviously a big factor, uh, the river rip, flow of the river, ice from the river, uh, and, and seismic conditions. And I and I always say you know people ask you to design for an earthquake or what, and, and you design for an earthquake and you design for a tornado or a hurricane, but you don't design for them at the same time because that would just be too improbable to even think about. So the, the expense would just be ridiculous right. if you wanted to go that route. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of like seismic factors there, because we don't have earthquakes a lot in the middle of the country, but we could have rather big ones. If the New Madrid example from the early 1800s is any indication, is the bridge designed then to move if the earth moves? Is that the way it works? The, the, the bridge will move, but not too far. There, okay, there are, that's there good are, to know. <laughs> uh, there are uh, hold downs and lock up devices that will allow some movement and then, and then take a load if things go too far. And uh, you know, the bridge is designed in a really major event to, to sustain some damage, but not collapse and to be able to remain open for emergency traffic immediately after the earthquakes. So. And as obviously our audience is able to see in the images we've already seen and the video we've seen, it's a cable stayed bridge. There's a lot of different kinds of bridges. Why did you all choose to make it a cable stayed bridge and what's the nature of the cables and how does that work? Well, the cable stayed bridge by its very nature is an aesthetically pleasing structure. I think most people would agree and you can do some, we'll talk some more about lighting and some other things later, but it, it, it looks great in the, sit, in, in the setting and you know, this will be part of, part of the downtown skyline. But, but more than that even, it just it makes sense for the, the, the span length that we have. We have to span 1,500 feet. This will be the third largest uh, cable stayed bridge in the country. Uh, so in order to span length, length there's, there's different ways to do it. You could have a girder bridge, mm -hmm. but your girders would probably have to be 60 feet deep. So in this case, we, ha we actually use the cables to hold each section of girder between each cable point, and the, and the deck can be shallower, so we don't have to build everything as high. Now, obviously, the, the tower gets very high, mm -hmm. and that's, why, that's one of the reasons we only have two, there's two towers, because there's a lot of expense in, in building those towers. And we've got a couple of slide images that just gives folks a reminder about what those different uh, parts are that show the tower for us as well as the uh, pavement as well as the, the cables themselves. And that's just the basic bridge components of the cable stayed bridge. Okay. And as we look at that, we've got, we're starting to get email questions in. I want to remind everybody you can send them to me at live at hectv.org. They're coming right to my phone here via text message. And I want to go to a couple of these general questions and we'll start interacting with our interactive student groups as well. The first. How many cars or trucks can the bridge hold at one time? That would be a weight <laughs> factor. And then, and then do you like up it by so much? Like you assume like, okay, it's designed to carry, I'll say a million pounds at a time, but we've got to make sure it really is going to carry a million, 100,000 or something? Yeah, yeah you, you, you'll put a factor of 1.75 is, is the okay. So we figure out how many trucks, the trucks there could be. Uh, per, it's, it's really on a per lane basis and, and spread those out over the whole length of the bridge. Uh, yeah, I'd have to do a quick number, but it's probably, it's probably several thousand cars and trucks at, at, at the same time. So you, you figure out what that weight is, and then you're going to factor it up by 1.75 times okay. what that could be in order to put your design load on. Oh, very cool. Let's start going to our interactive school groups. The first one I want to reach out to is Wisconsin to see if you've made it into the bridge okay this morning. Gilmanton High School, Gilmanton, Wisconsin, come on in and say hello if you're there. What question would you like to ask Mr. Smith? What's the time length to build the bridge? Great question. Uh, this bridge will take four years from start to finish. Uh, you know, a, a smaller bridge can take a, a matter of months, uh, but a large project like this, you know, it's, it will take a matter of years. So this will be, it'll be four years from start to finish. And in terms of crew, how many people are we talking about building the bridge? 
Uh, there's probably uh, 80 to 100. I think Tom could probably answer that question a little later, but it's probably 80 to 100 uh, construction workers at one point. And, and four years in terms of the construction phase, but the design part obviously happened before then. How long, <laughs> how long has this been in the design stages? Uh, well, the, the planning stage goes back uh -huh. decades, but uh, the actual design, once, once an, uh, a, a plan was put forth, uh, the actual design took place a little less than a year. Oh, okay. So, and it was a very compressed schedule. They, they, they typically might take a year and a half, some, something okay. like that, but this was a very compressed schedule. Let's go up to British Columbia, Canada. McBride Secondary School in British Columbia, a question from you all. How many people are needed to build the bridge? <laughs> Thanks for that question. That probably varies from day to day, but we're talking somewhere around 100 to 120 people potentially to build it, but talk about a little bit about the different kinds of occupations that are involved, because you've got a lot of different kinds of workers on the bridge, right? Yeah, there are, there are people that are experienced with, with bolting up girders, with placing concrete, with, with putting the forms in. There's, there's people that uh, have specialties, uh, expertise in, in hanging the cables. You know, there aren't a whole lot of these, mm -hmm. these types of bridges around the country, so there, you know, there are people that have expertise and they kind of go from project to project. Uh, there's also people familiar with you know, drilling, which we'll get to a little bit mm -hmm. later, drilling the shafts in the river. That's very specialized expertise. So. Thanks, McBride. That's a great question. Let's move down to Tennessee. David Crockett High School in Jonesboro, Tennessee. A question from you all? And how big are your cables and how much will they hold? That's a perfect question because we want to talk about the cables and we've got some examples of them here. What am I looking at? What's uh, in my hand here, right. Jeff? This, this is a uh, pre-stressed wire strand and uh, it's 200, it'll hold 270,000 pounds per square inch. So this strand would hold about 50,000 pounds. Wow. Uh, so that, that's what you're looking at here. And this is, this is actually the same strand with a, with a plastic sheathing on it which will help prevent corrosion in the future. Okay. So, but it's a bunch of these cables There's, together that actually make up what we see right. from the bridge that's the cable stayed bridge. Right. Uh, we'll have anywhere from 31 to 73 of these, these strands in each cable. We'll talk about the pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll let you guys do the math. 50,000 pounds times 71, uh, 73 strands. Oh, good. That's a great little math question. And if somebody figures that out, we'll gladly take the answer from now, you. Now, we don't design it for the whole thing. We've got, you know, there's those safety factors we talk right. about. So, we, we, you know. We're, not, we're, we're making sure it's not exactly at that limit. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it'll, a little bit more than that. Uh, let's go back to another image of the bridge again so you guys can see what it looks like now, the cable stayed bridge. And then we've got an example that we can show you of what that pipe is actually looking like then. Because when you look at it on the bridge in the video, you see they're very, very white cables. And as we look at it here, Jeff, in my hand, is this like PVC pipe? What is this? That's polyethylene. Okay. okay so it's a very similar material, just what you might use for a, a drinking plastic drinking glass. Um, it's, it's not designed to hold any load. It's, it's, it's purely designed just to protect the strands from the, from the elements. So some special additives are, are added to what you might have on your, just your plastic okay. drinking cup. But it's, it's really the same, same plastic material. Provides a great barrier. It's easy to work with, easy, easy to couple together. And it's just a, it's a great, great uh, system. And it looks great in the light, too. It does look fantastic in the light, and it's amazingly light. I mean, when you think about it, uh, we're going to show you some rebar later, <laughs> which is amazingly heavy. But this is amazingly light when you think about it. But from a distance, it almost looks like it's concrete cabling, right. which, of course, would be way too heavy, I'm assuming, to put in the bridge. Uh, thanks for that question, David Crockett and Jonesboro, because it gave us a chance to go there for sure. Let's go down to Texas. We're being joined by M.R. Wood School in Fort Bend, Texas. M.R. Wood, what's your question? Yes. Oh, uh, how do you get the supports in the, uh, under the water to be able to build it? You know, like get the supports without uh, having it get in the way with the butter. That's a great question we're going to go into more depth about in just a little bit in the program in terms of getting the, how do we actually build it underwater because we're going to go into the foundation question. So hold on to that thought, M.R. Wood. I don't want to <laughs> lose it by any stretch of the, of the imagination. We will come back to that. Um, oh, this is an interesting question that came to us via the internet. These cables um, the stuff that we're seeing, where are the products made? Where are you getting everything from? Is it local? Is it nationally? Uh, it's, it's national. It's throughout. Uh, this, the strand, there's actually there's seven wires in each of those little strands. So those wires are fabricated in Florida. Um, and then they're, wound, they're wrapped together in a strand. I believe that's done in Tennessee. Forgive me if I'm wrong. And then, the cable, and then, they're, t then they're shipped off to uh, Texas to put the plastic sh sheathing on. Because each, it's a very specialized, pro all of that's uh -huh. a very specialized process. Seems like a lot of movement, but ag again, it's, it's not done in a lot of places. So it's very, all are very specialized. And interestingly enough, I hope our school groups notice it's in states where you're actually located. <laughs> he mentioned Tennessee and he mentioned Texas. Now the cable stayed bridge that we've got happening right now that we're building across the Mississippi River is the newest one, obviously. It's different in design than some other ones we've got in the St. Louis area. And we wanted to 
to show you that the differences and let Jeff speak a little bit about just to the variety of bridges that we've got going. So, for example, there's the, the MacArthur Bridge, the Eads Bridge, the Poplar Bridge, and the Martin Luther King Bridge that are in the St. Louis area. And we're going to bring up first the MacArthur Bridge, which is actually a railway bridge that crosses the Mississippi River just what would be south of downtown St. Louis. And as you bring that up, you're going to see that it looks very, very different from what the cable stayed design looks like. The MacArthur Bridge, which we'll be seeing in, in, in there in the, in the rail footage, it's a truss bridge? It is a truss bridge. And the one that we see in the background, it, then the Poplar Street Bridge? That's the Poplar Street Bridge. Span, right. both, and both have spans about five to six hundred feet. Okay, and so the Poplar Street Bridge is, is, is it also works that way, and that's what we're seeing here from a distance. And now, what makes the distinction between like why build the Poplar Bridge that way and now do a cabled stayed? Uh, that, that's also a great question, and a lot, a lot of the, sp uh, the sp structure types kind of depend on the area, era in which they were built. You'll see a lot, uh, trusses are, are uh, you see a lot more trusses uh, in older times because material was very expensive, but labor wasn't as expensive. So you can save a lot of material by putting all these small pieces together. The Poplar Street Bridge, as you see, uh, was built in a different time, the, the 60s, where you, material was cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very easy, easy uh, structure to put together, but there's a lot of steel, steel in it. Okay. We get to the cable stay bridge uh, uh, now, and that's, that's more of a new technology. It's been around for a, a few decades, but uh, it's still more of a newer technology uh, with the cable system. So that, ref that re again, reflects kind of advancements in technology and materials so that we can span these longer distances. And you mentioned the cable stay as a comparison. The Alton Bridge, which exists even further north along the river is another example of a cable stayed bridge, correct? correct? The one that's by Alton, Illinois. And that's what we're seeing here. This is a beautiful aerial shot we've got at the Alton Bridge. Ooh, it looks like the helicopter <laughs> was moving a bit for a moment there. Um, and is, is this to a large extent what the Mississippi will look like, the new one will look like when it is yeah. finished project? Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, it, that's a little shorter. The tower's uh -huh. a little shorter and the span's a little shorter, but it's essentially the same kind of bridge. And, and there are different things you can do with the towers. That, that, uh, that bridge has a single tower with cables all going over the top. Uh, the, we have what's called a delta tower mm -hmm. with, with two separate legs and the cables coming out of each leg. Just depends on, on uh, the, the seismic considerations, the, the span length, things like that, as well as aesthetics, how you, how you want the bridge to look. Now, people may be aware, hopefully, of a little bit of history in St. Louis and the first bridge that crossed the Mississippi River here is the Eads Bridge which we've got some great footage of yet rather famous bridge in terms of design and construction and is, is this another example of a truss bridge? That is a trust arch because okay. there's, there's two what we call ribs or the circular sections uh, you can see in that and then there's, there's steel framework in between those, those, uh, those arches. And this, this was built around what 1870? 1870? And talk a little bit about the nature of its design and construction, because obviously these people building it here over 100 and, oh my gosh, 140 years ago yeah. now, had to go underwater too. Uh, they did, uh, um, and that was some of the, that was really one of the first uh, instances of a, of a case, a, a case on types foundation where they actually dug down under, and, they, and the workers were in an enclosed area under pressure to keep the water out, and they and they dug up the material and, and took it out. And of course, there, you know, there were some some issues there with, with what we now know it to be the bends mm -hmm. uh, and and some worker injuries there. And this was the bridge. If, if uh, you've been following the men who built America on on the History Channel, this bridge was was the Andrew Car Carnegie Bridge. Uh, featured prominently in that, uh, in oh, that series. Oh, very cool, very cool. So look up a little bit more about the Eads Bridge and its construction because I think you'll find that story fascinating. And obviously we mentioned a whole bunch of names there. The Eads Bridge, the Poplar Bridge, the MacArthur Bridge, the McKinley Bridge, and that leads directly to an internet question we got here. Is there a name for this bridge as, as opposed to the new Mississippi <laughs> River Bridge? No. Uh, there, there's not yet. Uh, and politicians will have to, uh, to hash that out when things are things are done. Very good. Let's go to more student questions and then we're going to invite in Randy Hitt from the Missouri Department of Transportation to join us to talk a little bit of building the, about building the foundations. Let's go back to Wisconsin. Gilmanton, what question do you have? How much money did the bridge cost, like all the materials and stuff? Uh, the, t the total cost for construction is $230 million just for the main span and then the, the, on, on you, the main span and then the side span, so everything that's supported by the cables. And then there's, there's additional bridges uh, that, that span the rest of the way to, to land on, and interchanges on either side, which is uh, another uh, 70 million. 
Oh, wow. total. So, but the bridge we're talking about today was 230 million. And it's a combination of funding sources, right? It's yeah. Missouri money, it's Illinois mm -hmm. money, and it's federal money as well. Correct. Correct. Now, what is it? The fact that an interstate highway system goes across the bridge that makes it federal eligible, or are federal funds available for all sorts of projects? How's that work? Well, fe federal funds are available for all, all sorts, but but the fact that it's a, uh, an interstate designation does guarantee those funds. Okay, very cool. Back up to British Columbia, McBride. A question from you. What is the life expectancy for the bridge? This bridge will last forever. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, th that's a consideration we take into design, and, and this bridge will be designed for 100 years. So when, when you, you have to consider corrosion, uh, fatigue, you know, how much wear and tear vehicles put on it when, uh, when you design it, and you kind of back those things up into the, into the design life that you want. So the design life's 100 years, but, you know, we, we hope. I mean, if you look at the, the Eads mm -hmm. Bridge, has been around for 140 years. So. You know, we, we would hope that uh, with proper maintenance, it'll, it'll last far longer than that. Very good. And you're seeing the new bridge under construction there again, and that gives me the chance to say thanks very much to Jeff for being here. We really appreciate it. If you've got more questions for Jeff, don't hesitate to email them to us at live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. But I'm going to invite Randy Hitt into our conversation now. He's the MRB Deputy Project Director for the project. He works for the Missouri Department of Transportation. Randy, thanks very much for being here. Pleasure to be here. Give the students a little bit of an idea about what it is you get to to do as working on this project? We get to oversee all the design uh, once the, it was determined that we had the funding available for the project and worked out all the agreements with, between Missouri and Illinois that uh, we began to design on it with HNTB and uh, within a year of that and working with through all the environmental and different permitting issues. At that point we began construction at the $220, $230 million project with our contracting team. We let the project putting the plans together at Ward for Bid and we oversee all aspects of the construction of it to make sure it's built correctly, all the uh, materials are tested, every uh, bolt and every uh, piece of steel and concrete in the project is tested for quality assurance to make sure we get that 100 year design life out of it. Oh, very cool. Well, that, you obviously are getting to do a lot of stuff then, which is yes. great to hear. We had a question that came in earlier from the students down at MR Wood about the building of the foundation and dealing with the water aspects of it. And we're going to go to that question now because that's exactly what we want to begin to talk about with as we talk with Randy about. We've got a number of slides here as we're going to look at as we talk about building and testing for the bridge foundation. So let's begin with just this basic slide, which gives you an idea of the different parts of building the foundation itself. And that's what we're seeing here on screen, Randy. Yes, it is. Uh, what, what we have for the foundation for the two main towers is called a drilled shaft. A drilled shaft kind of looks like a column that you see on a bridge, except it uh, extends down to the bottom and, and into the solid bedrock at the bottom. So to begin that process, and this is used on river piers and other land piers that you may see on a lot of different types of bridges, is a, a giant steel casing, which looks like a giant steel pipe that's inserted in, through the mud and water and down to a solid bedrock and actually embedded into rock, which is a foot or two. At that point, we uh, go through and auger out all the material, the mud. In this particular case, we have 50 to 70 foot of mud and silt there. Mm. And that's all um, removed from the inside that steel casing. And then we uh, core the rock out at the bottom to the proper elevation. And this particular bridge, 16 to 20 feet of solid rock is what we had to go into. And then we set the reinforcing steel and then lastly pour the concrete. These are uh, very uh, larger scale than a typical bridge as they're 12 foot in diameter. Mm. And now this one is, is some images from you actually dealing with the test shaft here. And you're obviously dealing with this in water. You're obviously off the, off the, off the bank line and into water, right? Yes. Uh, what we did on this particular project, just to assure that the rock had all the uh, strength characteristics that uh, we designed for, we actually produce a shaft that looks much like a production shaft. It's not actually in the foundation. and has these uh, giant hydraulic uh, cylinders or jacks at the bottom. And once this is poured, then those are... Uh, um, pushed up and we test how strong the rock is and we test it to failure. However, in this particular instance, we had such good solid rock that we not only uh, did not go to failure, we hit 36,000 tons and we still did not fail it and we set a world record in the process. Wow. Oh, that's very cool. I think we've got a world record going here. And this is actual video footage of you guys doing the test, uh, drilling a test shaft, right? Yes, it is. Um, it's just normal production with the steel casing, removing the material, just like you see here. And once all the materials are removed, just like any other production shaft, except this one has the big hydraulic cylinders at the very bottom, and uh, that is uh, uh, energized up to get the strength. You see also the workers uh, testing the, making sure it's clean at the bottom, and also making we get the proper elevation to the bottom of rock. 
So this is dealing specifically with, with the shafts. We're also going to be able to talk about later on about the use of the coffer dam, which enables the, the workers to actually work, so to speak, in the river, for lack of a better way to phrase it, to actually pour the concrete for those foundation piers that you see when you see the images of the bridge. So you'll also have a chance to talk about that. So as you're thinking about this question, these ideas students, put those two things together. They're having to deal with water and, and pour, getting rid of the water to pour the concrete for this, but they're also having to get rid of the water to obviously to build those foundation piers, which we'll look at when we look at the coffer dam. Now we've got some great video here of it of the construction going on which we'll be able to run as we talk a little bit about building the concrete and rebar shaft. So as the students begin to look at some of this video here again of just the bridge on the river let's see if there are questions that students might have um, for Randy so far just about what we just saw. Let's go back to Tennessee. David Crockett High School in Jonesboro what would you like to know? How high is the bridge off the water? Okay high, oh excellent how high is the bridge off the water? At two feet above flood elevation, we have to maintain a 60-foot clearance to the bottom of the bridge, and that's for the navigation channels uh, for the barge traffic to go through. Uh, the river actually varies quite a bit. Uh, 30 feet is about typical of the depth of water we deal with. Uh, however, the river has been as low on our gauge as negative four on the gauge, all the way up to a high of a uh, flood stage of 36. So the river has actually fluctuated 40 feet in elevation from uh, in the four-year process that we're building this. As you guys look at the video you're seeing now, this part of this construction video, that part of the image is actually of the approach ramp on the Missouri side that's going to take us onto the bridge. And here you see part of the surface of the bridge that's already been put there. There you see the top of the towers. And, and again, there you see a close-up of the cables and, and the road surface that's there. Now these towers kind of go into a pyramidal shape, a pyramid shape. Is yes. there a design reason for that that's not just aesthetic? Yes, it is. Uh, these are delta-shaped towers. There's different type of cable stay. As Jeff mentioned, you got a single tower. You can also have what's called a uh, H. It kind of looks like a big goal post. That's what you see in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, the cable stay mm -hmm. bridge down there. This is a delta shape, and it just happened to be the most economical design for our particular project, easiest to build for constructability purposes, and that's the reason this uh, particular design was chosen. Very cool. Let's go back to Texas. Let's go down to our friends in the Fort Bend School District. MR Wood, another question from you guys. On the bridge, are there pedestrian walkways, and if so, are there jump barriers? Oh, good question. Thanks. Uh, no, there is no pedestrian. Uh, this is an interstate uh, highway, so we don't like to mix uh, pedestrian traffic with interstate. We also have the Eads Bridge and other bridges that have a lot of good bike and pedestrian access on there, so we didn't really need to replicate that and add uh, extra capacity on there. So therefore, we don't have the uh, jump protection and things like that. Uh, one thing of unique uh, aspect we did go through in this process, in the process of designing this, we went through a security threat assessment because it mm. is a very important structure. And so we went through some security clearance to look at some of the latest uh, terrorism technology to figure out what we could uh, incorporate into our project to prevent those uh, any uh, intentional or unintentional incidents that happen on the bridge. Great question. Um, are the, an email question we had come in, are the two sides of equal elevation? Like in terms of, in terms of, I guess, both the towers are of equal height? Yes, both towers are 400 feet in height, and uh, that is two-thirds the height of the St. Louis Arch. And the height is the function of uh, how long a span. So when you're 1,500 feet or five football fields long, that's the height uh, that was required for the angles of the cables for everything to work out. So 400 feet, and that's uh, from the top of the foundation up. And, um, and so actually you got another 100 feet of uh, foundation below that, so you actually got a little bit of a bridge you don't see, but what you see out of the water is roughly 400 feet. And that's what I was going to ask as I was pointing down. So yes. there's more that's going down, and, and do they both go into the bedrock the same depth, or was there any kind of variation made for that just on the basis of what the geology was? The geology is just slightly different. Uh, it varied between 16 and 22 feet into solid bedrock was okay. where we went. Let's begin to talk a little bit about how they built these shafts. We're going to give you some more images. We're going to show you the casing installation and the process for that. So we'll bring those PowerPoints up now. And the first thing we want to talk about as we talk about building the concrete and the rebar shafts is something called the casing installation. So you see what the exterior of the shaft is going to look like that's going to go into the river. So that's what we see right here, Randy. Yes, the casing installation, like I said, it looks like a big steel pipe. It is a... Uh, this is about a 90,000 pound pieces of steel pipe. If you look very closely at your slide there, you see the concrete counterbalance for the crane so it doesn't tip over. That's the gray pieces there. You can see a little white dot there. That's a hard hat of one of the workers. So that gives you some sense of scale there. So very heavy uh, weight and these are actually um, inserted into the river and actually it's, uh, they're kind of a twisted into, uh, into rock at the very bottom. So this acts as a form for your um, drilled shaft and also keeps the, the water flow out. 
uh, when you're trying to pour it and setting your reinforcing steel. So that's going to go in first, and then what happens is an auger goes in and actually begins to drill out the, the soil, the mud, the muck, and eventually the bedrock. Correct. And what you see here is a picture of one of those auger devices. And uh, like I said, these are 12 foot in diameter, so they, it's a very large, lot of, lot of amount of material that comes out of there. When these are filled with concrete, they'll hold 400 cubic yards of concrete each. So the material's moved out. We've got roughly 50 to 70 foot of silt, depending on where you're at in the river here, uh, that's all removed out uh, with this uh, giant augering process. And the next image is, shows us the, the core being drilled in and the retrieval of what comes out as you guys do that then. Yes. So once all the mud and debris is left and we get down to solid bedrock at the bottom of the river, uh, next we need to go into solid bedrock. Because the entire weight of the bridge rests upon, it goes down into, sits on the rock at the bottom. So and in order to do that, we have like a big giant core drill bit, which actually creates a kind of a, a small track area around the outside. Of a, and so when that's done, then this bell-shaped uh, device fits over top, snaps mm -hmm. off the rock, lifts it out into uh, large sections, and then it's removed uh, off-site. And you had quite a bit of that bedrock that came out, and that's what this video is going to show folks. Is This is actually from that drilling shaft, from one of your drilling yes. shafts, right? This is bedrock from below the surface. This is one of the actual pieces you see there, and you see some of the weathering seams on a portion of it. This came from near the top. And uh, numerous ones of these were removed, and they were set on barges, and we actually uh, repurposed these and used these for armoring on the bank for erosion control on the Illinois side. Now, we're about to go into the questions that deal with pouring concrete under the water, folks. We've gotten a bunch of those from the Internet as well as the ones that happened from us here before. We want to give you an example of, of, of the rebar that's going to go in as we build this, this shaft now. So we're going to the next image, which is going to talk to you about rebar installation, because obviously you've got to have a lot of steel component that's going to enable us to make sure this concrete all stays together and is, is appropriately uh, constructed, right Randy? Yes, what you see here is uh, reinforcing steel helps with the, uh, the tension or the forces that pull apart. Concrete is good for compression. So being in a seismic zone, we have a lot of tension forces on this bridge. And so the unique process that our contracting team come up with was hanging these bars from giant straps. And these are, what you see here, there's actually groups of three of these, 14 groups of three that go uh, the whole entire length, about 100 feet of that. So this particular rebar, as you can see in the scale here, about the size of a Coke can, mm -hmm. and it also uh, weighs 13 and a half pounds per lineal foot. That's right, 13 and a half pounds per lineal foot, babe, folks. And we've got what? A little more than obviously a foot here. Yeah. It's heavy stuff. And, uh, but that's going in, and then you're pouring the concrete around that using that casing installation that we saw before. Yes. So you're literally pouring the concrete through the casing and it goes then underwater into that space that's yes. been created. And, and we've got a good slide image that shows that process at work that takes you to that. Yes, a lot of people are amazed that uh, if you tried to pump out all the water and pour the concrete in the dry, what would happen is the water pressure from the river would blow in the bottom and bring in all the mud and sand, which you would not want. And so you actually pour the concrete underwater. A lot of people don't realize that. So the inside, once it's cleaned out inside that steel casing, mm -hmm. it's actually cleaned out. There's a giant steel tube called a trimmy that's inserted all the way to the bottom. Concrete is pumped through that where it seals up the bottom, as you can see in the diagram, and concrete is continually pumped into the existing concrete. The concrete level rises, push the water out the top, and you can see on the right that where the construction worker is uh, actually uh, testing the elevation of the concrete and the steel casing to make sure it's always inserted at least five feet in there, and that way we don't get uh, the water to uh, wash out the concrete. And it's a very efficient process and makes for good concrete. Wow, that's kind of amazing. You don't think about that idea yeah. that it would actually be good that you pour yes. the concrete. And when we talk about the concrete itself, how do you know if you've got good concrete versus bad concrete? What, what, what's the consistency of concrete you want and that kind of thing? All the concrete is... Uh, tested, uh, we not only test the actual concrete that goes in, but we ask the components that go into it. We test the cement individually, the aggregate that goes into it, the sand, and all the different components that mix it up. We have uh, quality control and quality assurance inspectors on site. When the loads come out, they're tested when they come out of the truck before they're actually incorporated in, and we do test specimens of it to assure that we got the right strength uh, specified. In this case, it's 5,000 PSI for our drilled shafts. Okay, great. That's per square inch. Yes. Just in case. Uh, let's go back to Wisconsin. Gilmanton, another question about putting these shafts together? How long does it take for that concrete to dry? Typically, concrete uses about a 28-day uh, compressive strength is what we uh, go off of. And that's uh, most of the strength of concrete is derived about 95% of it in a 28-day period. But uh, concrete will continue to gain strength over time. So 
Uh, normally our, our concretes are such strength that we were achieving our, our design strengths within a couple weeks, but uh, at 28 days we were assured all strength was attained. Oh, very cool. British Columbia, let's go back your direction. Another question from you. How do you build a deck on a bridge and it, it must be difficult to assemble and keep together without breaking? The uh, sections of the bridge are built in a 40 foot uh, lengthwise and it's a, kind of a steel cross frame uh, assembly that's actually built upstream at a yard. It's floated down by barges and lifted into place and bolted in. And once this is uh, accomplished, uh, then you set concrete deck panels on top of which are 10 inches thick and then there's a two inch concrete wearing surface that goes on the top. So there's a very regimented uh, process about uh, surveys done constantly when each section is uh, set there. A uh, series of surveys to make sure it's always in alignment. There's some cable adjustments and other things to get it in. So when we get to the uh, final section, the last, last piece that goes in will uh, uh, fit perfectly in at the very end. Thanks, British Columbia. Great question there. Let's go back to Jonesboro, Tennessee. David Crockett High School, another question from you. How many tons of concrete are put into each shaft? I don't know the exact tons. I can tell you it's 400 cubic yards, 145 pounds per cubic feet. I can't do that math in my head right now, but uh, so it's, a, it's quite a bit of weight. So typically a concrete truck that arrives on our site hauls between eight cubic yards and nine cubic yards. So there's a tremendous amount of weight that goes in here. The entire bridge though does weigh about uh, 30 million pounds. We have about 8 million pounds of reinforcing steel and about 15 million pounds of structural steel. So it's a very heavy bridge. So like we mentioned, all that weight from the towers and the bridge deck and everything all has to be transmitted down through these foundations and the bedrock at the bottom. That's the reason they have to be so robust. Cool. Thanks, David Crockett. Once again to Texas. M.R. Wood, another question from you. Go ahead. What makes this bridge safer than the last bridge y'all made? <laughs> <laughs> well, now all your bridges are safe. We'll assume yeah. that for a moment, Randy. But are there certain unique safety factors? Just because obviously technology changes over time and you're, we're building yeah. a new bridge. The bridge has the, uh, as, as we go with new technologies and new materials, uh, the bridge always, uh, designs always get a little bit better. We've incorporated a lot of things that the older bridges did not, specifically in a seismic. Uh, we've learned from uh, previous earthquakes in California, Japan, and other places around the world how to better design to withstand a lot of these forces. And that's the primary component we designed for the uh, barge impacts and things like that. But some of the uh, increased uh, uh, quality of materials that go into and some of the design criteria that we've learned over time and also, uh, like I said, mentioned like something like seismic threat assessment, something we would not have considered on previous ones uh, to uh, better have sustainability on, uh, for the 100 year plus design life of the bridge. Thank you for that great question. We've had another email question come in and dealing with floods. What's the bridge's relationship to, to floods themselves? Does the bridge and its placement affect the possibility of higher or lower floods in St. Louis? Do you take floods into account as you design the bridge? Yes, you take the... Um, in a flooding situation to make sure that you still not going to affect the flooding at the highest point in 1993 that we had was not going to affect that at all. And uh, one of the things that, um, you know, with the uh, flooding, you also got to look at the ice and different things like that that come through there. But um, yes, we do look at flooding. Flooding is more of an impact when we're trying to construct the bridge. Like I said, we, we've had a 40 foot differential from the time we uh, different stages of the bridge building here. Oh, very cool. Randy, thanks very right, much for joining you. us. As you leave and we, and we meet Tom for a moment, we're going to give everybody a chance to see some of the video of the different cranes that are working on this construction site. And obviously they're dealing with a lot of great weight themselves as they work on everything. And you're seeing those cranes that are obviously got to be as high, if not higher, than those 400 foot towers that the men were describing earlier. And we're being joined by Tom Tavernero, Tavernero now, who's the project Correct. manager with MTA. So Tom, thanks very much for being Thank with you. us today. Give the students a little bit of idea about what it is you're doing with the project. Well, as a project engineer, I'm working with uh, other engineers. We have 14 other engineers on, in our group. And uh, we work with the field people and uh, work out the ways to construct, the, to build the, build the project. So the designers design, the, say there's a footing that's 20 feet thick, that's uh, 10 feet below the river level. So we figure out how to, how to build that. Um, what, you know, how, how to design the cofferdam, uh, you name it, just, just the whole host of activities. We, we go in, design temporary um, access to the work, 
things of that nature. And as promised, we're going to talk a little bit more about pouring foundation and concrete underwater, so to speak, though technically speaking, it's not underwater because the water's been moved away. Right. But that's what we're talking about when we talk about a coffer dam, because obviously a great deal of the foundations, a great deal of those piers are, are being built underneath the, water, the surface of the water. So our first slide gives us some idea of the, of the bracing that's going to form the, the shell, so to speak, of the coffer dam. That's right. So <clears throat> this slide is a coffer dam bracing. It's 66 feet uh, in width and 106 feet in length, and it weighs about 320,000 pounds. We had these pieces pre-assembled. They were at a, at a facility in Ohio, and they were trucked to the project and put together in one piece up at our, uh, our yard, which is a few miles upriver. And then we were able to take that and with one crane, set it on a barge, deliver it down, and set it in one piece, saving time in the construction schedule as opposed to having to build it, uh, build it piece by piece uh, in the river. Okay, and then our next image, I think, takes us to the installation process, gives That's us a, a slide image of the cofferdam installation, which we see here. Right, so these are, uh, you can see the cofferdam bracing that's been set in place, and these, uh, the steel that forms the walls are sheet pile, and uh, the sheet pile, they weigh about 11,000 pounds for a four-foot section, so we'll stick the sheets together and uh, vibrate them into place. And you can see here that uh, the, what the, what the uh, connection between the sheets looks like. It's kind of a knuckle and a finger here that wraps around. So, so this, those sheets that you guys were seeing in that image that were those tall sheets, this is what we're talking about. Right. So this is a, a little sm smaller size, but uh, the sheets, the a pair of sheets, two pieces, is about four feet in width, four feet of wall, and then these are 80 feet in length. So in essence, you're creating a big room that's, that's right. going to wall off the water that's right. so then you can pour foundation in there and create level surfaces and workers can actually work inside these walls to smooth out the concrete and make sure it works right. That's right. That's right. All right, let's go to our next picture which talks about the leveling, which shows the leveling process. Right, so we placed, we placed the, before, before we dewater the coffer dam, we have to place a seal to, up, to uh, resist the uplift from the river. And so we placed this similar to a drilled shaft Place it underwater, and once once it it's 13 and a half feet thick. Once it reaches design strength, and we can dewater, and this is what you you have when you uh, when you clean up the surface. It's kind of wavy, so we always uh, pour a little low, mm -hmm. and then pour a leveling slab on top. So you can see the the uh, rods that are sticking out of the concrete. They'll be cut off to grade, and then we'll pour a nice level slab. To, uh, to construct a footing on. If possible, I'd like us to go back to that image we just saw because I think it's a really powerful and interesting image for kids to think about contextually now about the fact that the river is actually outside those walls. That's right. So the river level is probably up. You can see where the, the change in color on the sheets is, you uh -huh. know, where it's brown, kind of what, where the top of the casings are. So the river level is about up in that level. And, and, and so from the top of the coffer dam, to where our uh, surveyors stand there is about 40 feet. And how much of this is going to eventually have concrete in it? Are we seeing what is the top surface well, of the concrete? Well, we're, we're about a foot away from the bottom okay. right now, so, so there, there would be a tw 20 additional feet of concrete for the, for the footing. So there's going to be a lot of pour that happens. That's, right. a, that's, a, that's an awesome image. Right. And, and, and we go back, we'll just go straight forward to the next image then which goes to the, the foundation reseal. And this is all the rebar that's going right. to go to create the foundation with all that concrete. That's right. And there's, uh, similar to the drilled shafts, it's using number 18 bars. Instead of three bar bundles, these are two bar bundles. And they're laid out horizontally, uh, longitudinally and transverse. So there's basically a grid, which we call a mat of steel. There's seven layers in the bottom of the, of the footing and five layers in the top. And so you can, you can imagine there's 1.4 million pounds of steel in the footing. Wow. And so in order, you know, the, here again, the designers say we want the, the uh, mats uh, 18 inches apart. Well, how, how do you support that? So um, we have 100,000 pounds of support steel um, that we designed to just to, just to keep the uh, permanent reinforcing in place while we place the concrete. And then the next image actually shows the, found, the concrete being poured into that, that right. area. That's right. And so when we look at that, that's what we're seeing here. So now we've got the workers. Remember guys, think in terms of where we are. The river's on the outside of these walls and the workers are inside that and, and we're pouring the concrete as we go, right? Tom? Right, so this concrete, it's about a 40 hour concrete pour. We poured a special uh, 
mass concrete mix, which uh, doesn't get as hot as the normal concrete. Um, but this is, this is probably 36 hours into the concrete placement. You can see uh, right by, by the workers, there's black hoses coming out of the concrete. That, that, um, those contain river water, which we pump to, to make sure that the center of the, center of the footing doesn't, the temperature doesn't exceed uh, 40 degrees from the outside, which, which could cause the concrete to crack and, and, and have problems with the footing down the road, durability issues. We run river water through and monitor the temperatures and that, that allows the, the, the footing concrete to both heat up and cool uh, within a, the proper range. And, and the next video that we're gonna bring up will give folks a chance to see these concrete trucks at work. Right. So the concrete comes from off-site, right? You've got concrete trucks right. who are bringing it in, and then in essence it's being, I don't know, hosed in to that location. Right, right. so we dump, we dump the concrete trucks into a, into a pump on the bank, and then there's a, there's a five-inch line, slick line we call it, that runs out the uh, walkway, and it goes through another uh, placing boom and gets deposited into the, whether at this point this is a seal concrete placement, but we had the same method for the footing also. Very cool. Let's go back to British Columbia. McBride, another question from you. What type of force is exerted on each tower? The different types of forces that are exerted on each tower and the amounts? Of Jeff could give you a little more specifics. Jeff, about the forces that the towers are dealing with. Uh, I mean, the, the tower has to, has to take uh, unequal forces from traffic. And perhaps you have uh, traffic just on one side or the other, so it's got to be able to take that, that unbalanced load. Uh, wind forces, you know, wind can reach 100, 120 miles an hour and, and exert a force of 50 to 70 pounds per square foot mm. uh, on, on those tower faces. I, so I, I, Tom was right about the, uh, the, the cable force. Uh, as far as uh, total loads on those towers, I don't, uh, I don't have that offhand. But, but yeah, I mean, you can get into, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds uh, of, of force uh, sideways on these towers, as well as the entire dead load. You know, we talked about uh, 60, uh, 60 million pounds. Uh, you know, all that's got to be going down through the towers as well. Wow. And one, one interesting thing when we're building it, you know, we're putting one, one, one piece on one side and another piece on the opposite side, and obviously the main span's longer. It, well, the tower, going through that process, the tower leans up to 20 inches at the top. Wow. So when we get done, when we get done it'll, be, it'll be vertical, but during the construction, it kind of rocks back and forth, and that's all accounted for in all the engineering that's done. Let's go back up to British Columbia. McBride, another follow-up question from you all. What are you doing for the safety of your workers? Oh, excellent question. Well, we have a pretty extensive safety training program that we take everybody through before they come on the job site. And then we have, uh, we have weekly safety meetings. We have walkthroughs with various crafts to, to identify uh, any issues we may have. You know, we're uh, real strict enforcement on our fall protection policies as far as um, being tied off if you're over six feet, you have to be in a full body harness. We, uh, you know, we're working at great heights, 400 plus feet, and so it, it is an important uh, process to go through. And so you're dealing with safety constantly, obviously, as part that's of the right. process. It's, right. it's, it's something that's always there. And, that's, and as you guys, again, if you do a comparison to the, the construction of the Eads Bridge and you look about the conditions under which they were building there underwater and what's happening here, I think it makes a real interesting comparison in terms of where technology has come today to enable us to do all sorts of things. Right. We've got some other email questions that have come in. So I'm going to turn to them now as Tom and I talk about this. So, oh, this is an interesting question in terms of like moving from one job to the next. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. This project gets done. Are you, are you, I assume your company's working on other projects simultaneously, and right. how does that process work for you guys? Well, the way our company works is you generally you're assigned a project, you stay for the duration of the project, which gives you a whole uh, variety of experiences. You get to go from the drilled shafts and the coffer dams to building the, the mass concrete of the tower to the cable erection. And then, so we'll go project to project, and it might be a cable stayed bridge this project, the next one. You know, we've had uh, hurricane building uh, uh, repairs of, of bridges in the Gulf Coast, uh, so it's pretty interesting. But we're generally, you know, our projects are uh, uh, generally three or four years long, so. As we look at this image of the completed tower, I'm going to ask our folks to keep it there. The water level obviously on the bridge varies, and we've had a pretty low level of water on the Mississippi River this summer. As we look at that, 
and you see the water level there, is that generally speaking where the water should be or should we expect it to be up a little higher than that? And, and ideally speaking, if we were at high flood, flood, and you may not know this from 1993 when that big flood was happening, but how high should we might expect it to go up the Tower Foundation? Well, it would, it would get up over the footing, okay. but uh, generally, uh, you know, this time of year, you might be at a river level between 10 and 15. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe hovering towards a 10, and we've been down to a negative three. It's never a concern that the, it's ever going to reach the level of the road service. No, no, no. And that's why it's 60 feet above, if I'm remembering that correctly. Right. Good. They're yeah. all nodding at me that my memory's right. right. That's that's 60 feet above at at a couple feet above flood stage. So we've had we've had river levels uh, up up close to that level, if not a little above. Mm -hmm. But right now we're probably 95 feet clearance to the. Oh wow. To okay. the deck. McBride, let's go back up to the wonderful world of British Columbia. Another question from you in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> How long did it take to plan out the design and run the design through trials? Well, as far as the construction engineering, you know, we started we started in uh, working on the drilled shafts in the in the spring of 2010, and just a detailed plan of uh, putting the the superstructure up the, between the cables and the steel and all that took our group, our consultants that we were working with, about about a year. Um, and during that time, the, the, the uh, steel was being detailed and, you know, there was a lot of other engineering going on. But uh, so we've had, we've had some things where we'll wor be working on one thing and w we, need, we need to be working on this now because it's going to take a year mm. or so. And I'm assuming all of your engineers are now working with the wonderful what, of world of computer assistant right. software and all sorts right. of really cool stuff. Right. Give the students some idea about if they were interested in design work, engineering work, what's the kind of technology they're going to work with at this point? What's the kind of stuff they're going to get to interact with? Well, it's three, and, and this is something that Jeff could, but it's 3D CAD drawings. It's, uh, you know, uh, 3D uh, computer uh, structural analysis programs. Uh, it's, it's something that you can design a part and and send it to somebody else and it, it, you, they can put it in their drawing and it actually runs like a, like a, whether that's, that's a plane or a bridge or whatever these days. Randy, so. you want to add? Pardon me, Jeff, you want to add? Uh, yeah, Tom's absolutely right. I mean, we use, we use everything from just spreadsheets uh, that, that you might have on your, on your home computer to, uh, to complicated structural analysis programs that, you know, you, you actually put in each piece of the model and put in the forces mathematically, and then it'll, it'll determine what all the forces are, and then you, can just, then you can figure out how big the members need to be. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an iterative process, and sometimes those models can run for, you know, a day, a day total once you get everything put in and just let the computer spin away to, to uh, figure out what all those forces are. Very cool. McBride, I'm going to go back up to you in British Columbia. You're going to get to ask the final interactive question of the day. What is it you'd like to know? Could you have saved money with reinforcing a nearby bridge? And if so, why hadn't you done that? Oh, interesting whole cost-effective question. Well, I think the, the, the issue here was a capacity issue, that the other bridges are uh, at capacity and they're constantly maintaining them. If you're, if you, if you live in around the St. Louis area, the congestion that's that uh, you go through from they are trying to keep the bridges up. But this is something that they figured they need the volume uh, to move, like Jeff said earlier, to move to the north and eliminate a bunch of congestion downtown, going from uh, St. Louis. Missouri to East St. Louis, Illinois. So. And as we think about future traffic, Randy or, or, or Jeff, whichever one you wants to speak to, as we think about future traffic options, are there options in the works about what could be done to continue to deal with this traffic consideration? Yes. Uh, as Tom had mentioned, we have three interstates on the, the last bridge to be built in the downtown area of St. Louis. And with three major interstates going across that, as it gets older, it was built in the 60s. So as we do repairs, that's going to uh, uh, you shut down three interstates basically to do those repairs. So this is, adds a lot of redundancy and some badly needed congestion relief. But uh, this project is uh, as one of the badly needed and so we will have traffic that goes on this uh, and current traffic models say it'll handle all the traffic up until about 20 years from now. At that point we can restripe it to three lanes by eliminating part of the shoulders and beyond that about 25 years as current models predict 
then we may be looking at a companion bridge right next to it to handle additional traffic. Randy, thanks very much. Thanks for joining us today. Jeff, thanks for being here. Tom, thanks Thank very you. much for being thanks here. For to all us. of our audience members, as always, thanks for being a part of HEC TV Live. A very big thank you to the Gateway Arch River Boats, who enabled us to go out on their boats to get all that fabulous footage you saw of the river from the river's perspective. Want to know more about them and how you can take tours, go to coreofdiscovery.com. In December, we'll be doing HEC TV Live again, so we can hope you'll join us then. Bye, everybody.